blessed us so much and has brought me from what I want you see here. I couldn't, you can see this finger, I couldn't move just a little bit after the accident at all. I couldn't move my legs any, and now you can see this left one especially is really starting to end the right one's following, it's just slower. Um, and the fingers have been a real, real chore to get them to play at all, because they get stiff after I play for a little bit, that's getting better and better, and the Lord is just blessed. But I want to say, you don't know, nobody in here knows, until it happens to them, how quick you can be either taken or something like this happen to you, because it happened like that. I didn't see the car, now, of course you know it was a, it was a hit and run, the car were in the minute, they kept on going after they hit me. But it happens so fast, as the Lord says, he'll come in the blink of an eye. We need to be ready to go all the time, because you don't know how quick you can be taken out of this life. And the Lord could have taken me, but he had a work for me to do. And I'm here starting that work again today. guys for all you've done for us and you're doing for us and just love you so much I can't put it all in the words how, how much I love you all so much I got a song I want to do but I have kind of a surprise I made a recording about 20 years ago and none of y'all really knew anything about this and I'm going to take the, my tablet over to brother Steve here and let him play it for you. And this is a multi-track recording, which means I played each of the instruments you hear on the keyboard one at a time to get all these parts. And I'm gonna let Steve, you got it Steve? Yes, sir. I think it's cute already. Yes, sir. So here, this is a song the church always has already heard me do before is Joshua Fit, the Battle of Jericho, but this is a whole different take on it. Go ahead, brother.
how we can even, I've, I've walked in stores and somebody stopped me from other churches and said, oh, we're praying for you, just yeah. wanted you to know. And I mean, so many churches across the lands, across, and I know the Philippines, I know so many different areas, like uh, East and France, I mean, there was places all over the place that were praying for us. Um, as this year has, this past year has played out, um, we have, wouldn't have found Michael except for when he went down into the ravine over close to, up here, close to sheep excavating. Um, there was first responders there. And so when they get there, he is not able to move. And he has um, a sweat jacket on, so in the pocket is his phone, and he couldn't reach his phone. And so they put the phone up to his ear, and he calls me. And first there's a message on my phone. I'm at work. We just left each other two and a half hours earlier. I had uh, late, uh, early lunch, dinner, late lunch together that I fixed at home. Then he left, went, came up here to the church to work, and then I left and went back to work. And so he um, calls me, and then finally I call him back, and the, the first responder puts the phone up to his ear. And I still have that message on my phone, the first one that he made to let me know that he had been hit. He was in a ravine, and he told me it's really bad. Call everybody, call the church, and pray, and let me pray. And, and uh, so the first responder said, um, ma'am, we'll be right here. We'll stay with him. And he, it was the coldest night, so cold, so frozen and icy. It, it, that snow had come so sudden. And so he, um, I was so thankful. He had filled up his car, so it's in there. It's still running. The headlights are on, so they could find him with those headlights down in the ravine. And they finally, they had to cut back so much of the brush and trees and things that were down there just to open up his door and get him out, put him in the ambulance and get him to the hospital. And it took him, it was after 11 o'clock, so his accident was, it was about 6.35, and he got about 11, a little after 11 is when he finally got to the emergency room. And even, even some of the ambulances had been in accidents because it was so slippery everywhere. So when he gets to the hospital, I'm looking at him, and he is, you would have not known that anything was wrong. It, absolutely. His car just has, like, the bumper pushed in, and I'm like, I wanted to see that his car was just folded up into, like, a, a ball right. that it hurt, you know, that he was paralyzed from his neck down. They took him to the CT scan to get a full C CT of him, and it's not broken, but what's happened is all that uh, vertebrae in his neck has just crushed, they said there was arthritis had crumbled and it was compressing his spinal cord so that it wasn't severed, but it was like um, the room had been made a lot smaller and everything had been compressed. And so they were waiting for all of the swelling and things to go down. So it was about two weeks before he was gonna be able to have his surgery. And Dr. Pace was gonna go in and do, and open it up and put a cage in around it so that would able to be able to grow back. So he finally gets to, um, he's in ICU, and all the different things are happening. They put him in a bed that rocks back and forth like this, so, and we go in and see all the different changes they were making to him. They do his surgery, everything looks good. They move him into a room, and his platelets drop, and he just, our sudden and all Brad is there, and he just starts bleeding from the wound. They take him that night back into surgery. His platelets have dropped, uh, and it's just, the blood is pulled in his neck. So they call a hematologist to come in and, and check and see what's going on. The next morning, the same thing happens. It fills up, he's just bleeding out. Put him, take him back to ICU. So he was no longer in the, just a regular room. And he's back in for, and he had two more surgeries after that. Well then, they decide nothing's going on right. So they put a, a tray in at that point and they put him back on a vent. We'd already had him there, so. He's back on a vent and he's not able, and it's all we can do is just keep saying, just keep praying, just keep praying, just keep praying. So they, um, we finally get through uh, getting him out of ICU, back into a room. They then put him in advanced care. We ended up being six weeks at, um, at that time it was Mercy. Um, on the seventh week, they send us over to the Baptist rehab, um, and then we, between Mercy and Advanced Care, we were there, and then they sent us over to Baptist, and we were there six weeks. And um, they taught us 
how to take care of someone. I had no idea, and I, when I left, my mind's thinking, I'll have to put him in the nursing home because he's over 250 pounds and I'm 5'1", and I won't even tell you what I weigh. So then um, I started to, I was like, whoa, let's don't get that honest. And so, um, so, so I just kept, in my mind, when we're at Baptist, I'm thinking, when we leave, I'll have to put him in a nursing home, and I'm not sure how I do it, but in six weeks, they teach me how to almost literally care for him just myself. I, I, I can't believe the things they taught me. And the, the Lord opened up my mind so that I could understand it wrap right around. And my family was there. And Brad was up there at every moment that he could. And Mom and Dad was. And Bree was. And they'd have to leave and go to work and not know what was happening. And um, Michael's work stood by him. And they just kept him kept him on insurance. Kept him on. Just said, whatever you need, just let us know. And um, our church and the different ones, you know, did fundraisers and helped us keep going. And everything, you know, Everything just kept going along really beautifully. We take them home. They give us a longer um, wheelchair. They give us, I mean, we have the hospital bed in the dining room. And I'm thinking, and at first everybody, you know, Bree and Brad and Mom and Dad and, uh, you know, and our Nancy and David came, our other two children, and so figuring out how to do this. And I kept thinking, Lord, I can't do this alone. And he kept saying to me, you're not alone. On that first night, and looking at him in the ER, the Holy Spirit said to me, he's going to be made whole. So I would come in every day going, expecting Michael to just sit up and get out. I so wanted him to get into my escape and let's escape. And, you know, and kept waiting for it. I didn't know the journey was going to be like this. Never knew the journey would be this hard. and this. But God never left me. Amen. He never um, didn't equip me. Never made me to feel that this was an impossible job. Right. He kept telling me with him all things were possible. Amen. And I mean, I, every day I looked at the love of my life. Every day I said, whatever it takes. And I would, home health is coming in. They're just still coming in to see us. You know, all the things I'm doing, they look at me and they say, you could be a nurse. You could be a nurse the way you're taking care of them. I said, no, I'm just a wife. And this is what this wife has to do for this season in our life. This is what this wife is going to do, and she will do it as long as she can. But, you know, God gives you the grace, and he gives you the mercy to do all that that you can do in that season of time. And then when that changes, you know, then, but this is what God's called me to do at this time, and I'm so thankful for it. I'm just, every day I'm thankful that I still had my Faberson to talk to. I still had him to tell me what to do and what to pull the back of the car and put it in and where to take it and how many miles did it need to be before and he's the best backseat driver in a wheelchair. He's the, I mean, he is so good at it. He's like going, whoa, slow that today. They don't have brake lights. How do you know? <laughs> if I've got my foot on the brake, he doesn't know that I have my foot on the brake, but he thinks for sure that I have not seen them slowing down and thought I was just going to plow into that. But he is the best backseat driver. One afternoon, there was all this yelling and screaming when I was going across an intersection, and I looked back thinking that he had left the van. He was somehow for the running got over the backseat and out with the I mean, it was like, ah, 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 and I thought for sure. He's not in the van anymore. So I'm, I'm crossing the intersection of Kroger, and I'm looking at the rear view mirror going, are you okay? Hey, you're out of the, I thought for sure I'd see him going that direction. Out the back of the van. No, he's just back there yelling. And all of a sudden I went, you know how people will turn into the intersection real quick? And I'm not watching to see if somebody was doing that, so I could have us having another wreck. So I'm back on my eyes. I said, could you not do that when I... My, my heart was in my throat, and so when I pulled into the parking lot at Kerner, I went, I'm getting out of the van, and I'm walking away, and I'm just going to keep walking. <laughs> I'm just going to keep walking. And I went, oh, no, you didn't call me to do that. Okay, I'll do it. And I just looked at him, and I said, I would not yell when somebody's driving across an intersection. Just don't do this. But, you know, nothing like having your wife driving you when you can't do it. I mean, it's... Ladies, isn't that just the best situation of all? <laughs> and he 
babysit that, but he's really good. And so one day he was so mad at me about things going driving on. I said, you know, I can turn that chair to manual and I'll turn you around and you're only going to see what we went through back there. And you're not going to, I will punish you. You will be in you will be in time out. You can't see out the front. <laughs> but he's even, he's even so, I mean, God hasn't even taken this away from him. I was in the parking lot, and for some reason, I just plunked plunk down to, to drive. You know, of course, I needed to back out. And he's like, what are you doing in drive? I'm like, what? How do you know that I'm in drive? And he just heard it, that it didn't just plunk down one into reverse. So he knew that I had put it down into uh, drive. And I said, that's just testing you. <laughs> I had no idea. Oh, my word. Because I have no idea when he's putting it in whatever gear he's putting it in. So, but I, I'm just so thankful. I'm so thankful. And I've been told, we, we saw at Baptist Rehab when we were working on um, just the basics, a lady came in our next to the last day to see one of the therapists to say how she was doing. And who would have known that she was quadriplegic and she was paralyzed from her neck down? And she said, she came up to the, our therapist to say, thank you for what you've done in my life. And look at me. And if you had seen her on the street, you would have never know. She's just this perfect looking woman. And she was four years out from her accident. And she says, I am just perfect. There's no residual, no nothing. I'm not having spasms anymore. Nothing is happening. And the therapist, and he talked to her and everything. And I'm just sitting there, and I just felt like God put, you know, just the shiny light, like touched by an angel all over. And um, he, the therapist, after she, they, the husband and wife left, he said, that was kind of weird that four years later she's coming to tell me this. And I said, oh, no, don't you even think that was for you. Don't you even think. I said, God sent her to me to tell me, don't you be discouraged. Don't you just think that six months it ought to happen, and 12 months it ought to happen, and two years it ought to happen? If it does, thank you, Lord. But she was four months, and she's flipping her hair, and she's just standing and talking and dancing, and I was just like, God, you sent her to me to let me know that this, it won't be forever. You know, it's this is taking time, but it won't be forever. And God still can do anything. We're, he's released to do anything that he wants to in our lives. So I was thankful for that. So what he's already done, I am so thankful for. What he continues to do, when we're able to witness and tell people. I mean, we kept a sign up in our room at Baptist. You know, we put a different, I put a different quote of the day so that we would know um, to keep our chin up, to keep our courage up. I put scripture on it. I put some kind of um, uplifting remark. And I, paste, I posted on Facebook and and keep other people abreast of what was going on with us too. And somebody would walk in and say, we love coming in this room because only love and positive is spoken here. And only realizing that how much you depend on God is in this room. And that's what we wanted. Because we needed, we needed to be reminded every day. We had to wake up to every morning going, this is, God is blessing us and God is doing the work in us. And what we're not going to be moved by what we're seeing and what certain circumstances are. We are looking forward to that, what he's, that work that he's going to continue to complete in us. So, and that's what I'm so thankful for. And that's what I'm thankful for all the churches, all the, the CMAers. Y'all have been such a blessing to us. And every, all the different, and our pastor and our youth pastor. And they have been, Stephen has cut over, come over and cut down trees and bushes and and uh, Brad has mulched leaves. I mean, you know, it takes a village to keep the offers and stuff, I promise you. And I just thank you for it so much. And we will continue to rejoice. And we are so thankful. And is Anchor next? No, I guess. Oh, got somebody else? Okay. See, I don't know the agenda. Thank you.